Good afternoon, morning. Welcome again to Turbo Tortoise Tech. We have something extra special and nice for you today. So sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Oh, alrighty then. So, what do we have? We have the new Ryzen 2950X Threadripper. Now, I built this machine for Cooler Master for their RAID show, actually, and it's about a week after that. And I said to them, please, please let me get hands on with this because the Wraith Ripper cooler that they have designed is incredibly impressive. It's practically two of their older V10 coolers that they've managed to sandwich together into one package, and it has one of the easiest mounting systems I've ever used. It's literally easier than falling out of a speedboat on choppy water. The finished product as well is just absolutely stunning. I mean, look at this cooler and the RGB elements and stuff that are on it. Now, we've teamed this up with the fast RAM that we had from our uh, predominant build there in the Ryzen 7 2700X. So it's got that 3200 megahertz CL16 goodness. And we're not going to be clocking that higher simply because we want to see what the processor performance is relative on those settings, not with extra DOCP that it has built and programmed for this chip. One other thing to note is that the motherboard overclocking software, the AI suite, has been vastly improved and will do your stepping for you. Now, I got this to 246 watts at 77 degrees, which is exactly what the cooler is advertised to do. So that's a good point there. But let's have a look at the remainder of the benchmark scores to see what it can do when we look at gaming. Alrighty, so the benchmarking that I've done for the 2950X, I set out to kind of look at two things. One, how much more multi-core performance you would get of 16 cores, you know, and, and 32 threads versus 8 core and 16 thread of the 2700X, and then how well it can still game. Because obviously with more cores, there's more power that needs to be drawn and a lot more management that needs to kind of come through from XFR and from the motherboard. I've tested this with the X399 Zenith Extreme, so there was plenty of power headroom and overclocking potential, and we did actually get that out of the chip. I managed to take it from 3.5 to 3.9, which was great for the multi-core scores, as you can see it went from 3156 to just over 3300 which is now then basically a hundred percent gain from the eight core 16 thread to this score now 3300 obviously that isn't out of box and it will come with some temps um, the kind of max out on those temps is about 75 degrees and this was with 246 watts of current being drawn that wasn't a very co super cool day and obviously that's going to kind of affect the temps but the Wraith Ripper cooler did an absolutely phenomenal job and lived up to its 250 watt quoted maximum temperature limit. Just a little thing to note as well as on the single core CPU, we saw a slight decrease, but the OpenGL saw a slight increase, which is quite interesting. So obviously Cinebench can take control of multi-threaded or has demand for multi-threaded application a little bit more on OpenGL than some of the other single core FPS tests, which we'll get into now. BF1, there's nothing really to report. There is a 10% drop in average frame rate, but it was incredibly smooth. I must say it didn't jump around at all, and the processor delivered a very nice gaming experience. That's two. Keep out of boys. Very similarly with CSGO, we saw slight increases, especially on our 1% lows through the heavy smokestacks, which is really cool to see. And 26% on the average is nothing to turn your nose up at. Obviously, Volvo is slightly better at using core optimizations. Good job, Volvo. We like this. Grenade out. Moving on to Dirt 4 on high, we saw massive performance increases across the board, especially when looking at minimums. It was extremely smooth, I must say. But when looking at Ultra, we see kind of the inverse and it kind of drops, starts to drop off a little bit, which is a bit 
odd, but uh, all things considered, it did get a slightly higher FPS. It wasn't as smooth. I must say the high was super, super silky smooth on there compared to the Ultra. So maybe when the single core performance demand is higher for XFR, it just kind of can't deliver on the you know megahertz and stuff that you want. Looking at Dota 2 Ultra, all I can say is Volvo, please fix. It wasn't jittery and jumping around and I didn't actually see the 0.1s in the Jetta, to be honest, but the overall experience was significantly worse off on Dota 2 when compared to the Ryzen 7 2700X. I can only assume that's down to some weird inefficiencies with Source 2 versus Source 1 engine. I don't know, That's it's super odd data. I can't really comment accurately on that to be honest. Now looking at Metro Last Light, we see an improvement in overall FPS, but once again, a slightly less smooth experience. The maximum frame rate isn't really something too worrying, but the minimum is a little bit. It was jumping around if you look at the graphs and jittering a bit here and there. And I was running this from that Plague Store 256 gig PCI Express NVMe SSD. So I'm not going to put it down to, you know, a hardware issue on the hard drive side for this one. Um, it's just very odd. Anyway, moving on to Overwatch on Epic, we see a slight performance decrease once again. 27% is actually quite a bit on the average frame rate. Um, I could only put that down to once again single core performance. It was, I think the, the, the XFR stuff needs to be refined a little bit and hopefully we'll see but better improvements on single core as we get newer BIOS iterations. <laughs> Moving on to Quake Champions on Ultra. The AMD sponsored game can use more of the processing power to give you a better experience. Do go on, tell me more. No, but it, it really was um, very, very nice. I must say Quake played phenomenally. I did do some software based recording with it. The processor basically laughed at me. And I think even with everything on lossless quality, I was probably using only about 30% to 40% while gaming of the total sort of processing power on hand. So not really doing the process of justice, but it did make for a really nice gaming and recording experience. Moving on to Unigen Superposition Extreme, we see nothing really to write home about as far as the score and average frame rates go. The temps on the GPU you can ignore to some uh, degree because they're not in the same testing environment. The case we were using was obviously that big MB530P which has a bit better airflow. So don't really pay too much attention to that. You can see that the max temps were, you know, very close. It was a bit of a cooler day um, for testing. So we see on 4K, it actually loses out a little bit, which is a bit surprising because we know once your resolutions get higher, generally the demand on the CPU drops a little bit because then it becomes more GPU intensive for the texture workloads. So that's a bit weird, but it's not really a massive difference. So if you're looking at kind of VR usage, it should be quite similar. Now looking at Vermintide 2, we see a noticeable gap for 1080p on the high end. You're looking at 16 to 19% for Vermintide 2 Extreme and on high more of the same with a very odd 1%, 0.1% low. Both of the tests gave a 20 FPS, 0.1%. But then when we drop the settings down to medium and low, we see that there's no real gap. So obviously when the GPU workload drops, so does the single core performance offset between the two processors. So good in a fair fight Finally, we move on to good old 3D Mark. Now, of course, it is going to obviously have massive gains here for physics, as you can see, with a 40% increase in score, 38% increase in frame rate, and 32% on the overall just for Fire Strike. But with some offset, there is loss, obviously, with the graphics tests, and it's the same as we go down the list. The graphic tests are a little bit slower, but the physics is absolutely thumping. Only 5% increase for Fire Strike Extreme on the multi core, and for Ultra, no real increase on the combined test. There was increase with the physics test, and now 0% or basically no difference as far as the graphics scores go when we get to 4K.
Lastly, looking at Time Spy, we see no real performance increase on the CPU, which is very interesting. Obviously, their test doesn't do multi-core, multi-thread as much as the physics tests do for the Fire Strike runs. So we see a 1% increase there, basically nothing to write home about. And once again, a small offset on 1080p gaming. Finally, in conclusion, what does this tell us? If we include the physics scores and the, all of the CPU tests from Firestrike and 3Mark, in the, in the scores we see a 3% overall improvement versus without a negative 2%. So it, I would say for gaming, you're gonna have a small drop of probably five to 10% in most cases, but with immense amounts of development power. If you're going to do 4K gaming, it becomes absolutely negligible and you can get this kind of multi-thread without destroying your bank account. The 2700X sells for around 7000 Rand and these sell for around 15. Now it is slightly more than double but it comes with extra PCI Express lanes and a whole bunch of other add-on features that would be great for development workloads. So if you're looking to get the full kind of complement of absolutely overkill computing for your home-based kind of studio or something to that effect, Look no further than the obliteratingly cool 2950X. So in conclusion, I think we can say the 2950X is definitely a successful launch once again from AMD. Not having to upgrade my motherboard, not having to deal with a whole bunch of issues with compatibility. They've increased and improved everything on every front and showing what they really can do with the Zen architecture. So if you are looking for development usage as well as gaming, relatively the full plethora of experiences that are available within computing, this is definitely something solid to look at. And I mean, just look at that cooler. Just look at it. It's, ah, it's so, it's so pretty. And it's incredibly easy to mount, guys. I can't stress how easy it is. The four bolts on the top literally go straight into the motherboard. It's one of the easiest custom cooling kits I've ever worked with and it's really really cool it's got a lot of nostalgia value with those dual v10s kind of being slapped together and that full base plate ah, just such good work from cooler master so definitely a turbo tortoise top tip as far as tech goes this would be something to look at if you are looking for that crossover between spaces we will be continuing with the enthusiast segment in the near future, hopefully with some RTX 2070 goodness. That's what I want to get my hands on next. Until then, have a good one. Sayonara. Volume increase, test once again, seashell seashells on the seashore, Ryzen 7 2700X. Threadripper 2950X, can you dig it? Soko!